Wait, Gus. I know you're excited. Wait. This one, this one, this one, this one. This RV resort has got a great big open field. So in the mornings, nobody else is up. I just let Gus off his leash and let him run through the field and he loves it. Hey. I want to go. I want to go out to the town. Do I do yeah. have a horse. A horse? Yeah, at the town and, and a horse. Are we going to ride a horse today? Yeah, I'm going to ride a horse. A Are you going to say giddy up, horsey? No, I'm not. I'm I not. just, I just going to do a cow. A cow? Yeah, <laughs> like, a, like, like Papa's. Like Papa's cow? Yeah. You going to ride a cow today? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the giddy up cow. Grady, here's yours. Grab a hoodie if you want. Layla, there's yours. The jacket. Well, Chase's with a jacket and I did long sleeves on Gabriel. Alright, fellers. Do what you do. Everybody load up. Mm -hmm. Load up, load up, load up. I gotta buckle myself down. Oh, okay, sit down. Hey, you, you close your door. Woo. Bye, okay. Daddy. Bye. He says he wants to buckle up by himself, but he never does it. So Gus has been chewing up our shoes while we're away. And we've got a lot of them right now. But I'm going to have to move them all so he doesn't do that. Henri dog. Hold on, Daddy. Stop, stop, stop. To turn right onto South Washington oh. Street. Oh, Daddy, wait. Oh. Ready, set, go. Hey. Come on, go. Hey. This is a red one. I'll help you. One, two, three. Whee! I almost did it, my you did it. You did a good job. So, we are here at the Gettysburg Heritage Center. That's it, right? Yeah, Gettysburg Character Center. We're waiting for our carriage ride tour through the Gettysburg Military National Park. The and boys are so climbing excited. on cannons. <laughs> Already. Yeah, it's gonna. I th I'm excited about it. It's gonna I'm be excited. good. The kids are doing their own filming, and then we're using this as our like our first field trip of the year. So I told them they have to remember things that they learn and write down facts when we get back. So we'll see how this goes. So as we're waiting here for the carriage ride, I want to say whenever I was doing the research for Gettysburg and how we could make this beneficial for the whole family, there's lots of different ways that you can take a tour. They, they have a tour like a double-decker bus that you could do. Um, you, could, you could do a, a, like a van. Uh, oh, you can even worse. do a walking tour. You can do a self-driving tour, which there is we an tried. app. We tried. We tried that. Didn't really like it. Didn't work well. And the kids are just kind of trapped in the car. So and I started doing more research, and there was a list of the top 10 ways to tour Gettysburg. And number one was by horseback, and number two was by carriage ride. And I thought, the kids would love the carriage ride. We can't do horseback because they of the little ones. They won't get bored so easy on a carriage ride. Right. We're outside, breathing fresh air. Yep. Yeah, they will really enjoy this because when you do a tour of Gettysburg, no matter what tour you do, it's going to be anywhere from two to three to four hours. And so this one is a two hour ride, which is, I think, a good enough time frame for us to be able to contain the kids and, and it be enjoyable for them yeah. and, and make it work for our family. Now, the cost of this, I want to say, was near $200 for our whole family to do this. So it is a little expensive, but this is also homeschooling Gabriel. for us. Mm -hmm. Come here, it's coming. The other tour rides uh, was anywhere from say 60 to $100. So, you know, an extra 100 bucks and we get a really cool experience. Once in a lifetime. That we'll always remember. Yep. It's coming, here it comes. Mom, it's horsey. What is it, Gabriel? Horsey. Horsey, horsey.
just to let you know there's blankets on the carriage because I know sometimes oh, it can get so windy. Nice. Thank so, yeah, you. Yeah, thank you. Tom and this is Spencer will be your co-drivers. Okay. And up front we have Blackie and Belle. They're two sisters, Percherons. Girls, I can get up first. And they're uh, draft horses. Okay. And that's what they're bred for. So they weigh about a ton of piece, so they're big enough to pull this, you know. <laughs> but the most important person on this ride is Kevin, and Kevin is your voice of history. So okay. for the next couple hours, he's gonna tell you all about what went on out here and everything. But this is your tour, so make it your tour. Ask him questions, you know. It, it will be going, We'll be hitting speeds about two mile an hour, so you'll have <laughs> plenty of time, you know, to ask him questions as we go along. And that's kind of the neat thing about this ride. You can interact with the guide, yeah. and we're going at the speed of history, so you can kind of see how the terrain and everything changes, which you don't see in a car. Preserves this battlefield today. It's amazing what they do. It means everywhere you look in the distance here, where you see a fence line, is the exact same type of fence in the exact same location as a soldier saw it. Where you see fields, or the same place as soldiers saw fields with farmers growing things. Where you see tree covered ridges, same locations where they saw tree covered ridges. So that means when we're right here, for example, this is an original road that was in place before the battle. It was a dirt road at the time. A soldier right here, looking that direction, sees exactly the same thing that you saw, with the exception, obviously, of the monument. That would not have been there. The southern army is going to come into this battle from the north. The northern army is going to come in from the south. Oh, okay. So ultimately, northerners, when they come in, some of them are going to be on this very road. That one, they're going to march right through us into the town that way. Southerners wrapping around there. So it's the exact opposite okay. of what we may think at first hand. And when the battle is going to develop in earnestness, that we'll talk about in some more detail, the southern army is going to be in these trees over here. That's called Seminary Ridge. The northern army of the United States on that highest point in the ground. And an easy thing you can remember, if you remember nothing else from our two hours, remember this one detail is gonna unlock the battlefield for you, the monuments. They are placed by the veterans in the years later and the monuments were required to be placed on the battle lines where the fighting began. So what that means for you, even if you don't know, you know, who's that person, what's that unit, where are they from, even if you don't care about that level of detail, you can look right here on this ridge line and you just play connect the dots with the monuments. And you can trace where the battle lines are in the distance and then you can see where they go further away from us. As you just follow the strings of monuments, they're not just picked randomly in prominent locations. They were required to be put where the soldiers actually were. If you remember nothing else and all the detail we're gonna talk about, remember that one. Because it lets you piece things together on your own. These are the two commanders at this battle. So again, George Meade, the Union side, Robert E. Lee, the Southern side over there. Totally different guys, though. Robert E. Lee, even in 1863 when the battle's fought here, soldiers under his command have already put him into a little bit of a mythic status. Many of them already believe he's borderline invincible. He's not, but what matters is some of them believe that he is. And so if Lee gives you an order, if you're a southerner, if you're a soldier in his command, you believe it's very well thought out and there is a very high chance of success, no matter what the battlefield shows otherwise on paper. For George Meade, it's very different than that, though. He's a very experienced commander, but he's brand new to command of the entire army. He's been in command of the entire army for three days when this battle happens. And he's going to prove by the end of these three days to be more than up for the task. Lee is the one who's going to start things here very quickly. He's making this invasion to end the war, hopefully. Because he knows after two years of war, it's not enough to just win a bunch of battles. Numbers and other things are not on his side. 31 million people are in the country when the war starts. When the split between North and South happens, out of those 31 million, 22 million are in the North. 9 million are in the South. And out of those 9 million in the South, three and a half million of them are enslaved. They absolutely are not fighting for the South. 
We cannot forget the centrality of slavery to everything connected to this war. So it means if you're just looking at cold numbers, you have 22 million Northerners versus five and a half million white Southerners. Southerners are using only their white men to fight. That is not the case with the Northern Army now. They are enlisting hundreds of thousands of now free and formerly enslaved black soldiers. They are enlisting thousands of people of Hispanic descent, of Asian descent. Hundreds of Hawaiians are now joining. That's before it's a part of the United States of America formally. The Union is bringing a very diverse army growing from 1863 forward. So Lee knows with these numbers, the war needs to end now. The longer it goes, we're going to run out of people at a certain point. So Lee is rolling the dice here. It's a gamble, no question about it. But he feels it has a good chance of success if everything goes well. So right now, we're standing roughly right here, just beneath the peach orchard. Robert E. Lee's battle plan is to take 14,000 of his men under the command of a man named James Longstreet. Longstreet's his number one dude. And Robert E. Lee calls Longstreet my old war horse. He tells him take 14,000 soldiers and march south. The goal then, as they're marching south on the map, it's this way, is they're gonna march far enough there that they can swing around these fields in a gigantic U-turn. See what's going on in the map here? Yeah. Gonna swing around the side and destroy the Union Army by striking its side. So this map is the battle plan based on what Confederate scouts have told Robert E. Lee. This map is what the battlefield actually looks like on July 2nd. What Robert E. Lee and James Longstreet don't know, their scouts got the report wrong about the battlefield. This map is what the battlefield really is and you see some key differences between these two. Most notable among them, although there's you know slight differences in where the lines are, got these soldiers back here that Robert E. Lee and the Confederates know nothing about. We've also got these guys. The Confederates know nothing about these guys, and if you catch it, this is exactly where we are. There are 11,000 United States soldiers right here where we are standing. So they've got a battle line that's shaped like a gigantic L, and the L bends here in the peach orchard. They follow the road here to the peach orchard, then it turns at a 90 degree angle, and now it's facing that way and it goes down across this valley through those trees towards the round top. But what makes our story really, really weird, these 11,000 guys don't know the Confederates are coming. It's not like they cracked the code and got in their way or are gonna surprise them or anything. It's a happy accident, or depending on your perspective, I guess an unhappy accident, when 14,000 Confederates are surprised by 11,000 United States soldiers and 11,000 United States soldiers are surprised by 14,000 Confederates but this shapes the fighting on July 2nd. Who's gonna win this titanic struggle that centers right here in the Peach Orchard? This is the eye of the hurricane. That's the problem when you're in a line like this where it bends at an angle. How many directions can you shoot at one time? How many directions can you be shot at from one time? And so if you're on this part of the line maybe, and somebody, a Confederate over there shoots and misses, it goes a little far, it can still get you over here. Vice versa, Confederates firing that way miss, they can still get that other part of the line. This is very vulnerable, this is very dangerous, and just to flash forward to the end of our story here, the, Union, the United States battle line here is going to be annihilated in this ground. They are gonna break, they are gonna be destroyed, and they are gonna be running for their life by nightfall. Confederates are gonna swarm through this whole area. So not only is unquestionably someone standing where we are at some point in time, very high likelihood somebody is shot where we are, at least one somebody at various times. Union line ferociously defending itself that direction. And then they break and Confederates swarming through here, but they don't stop here. They roll their artillery up here after them and they continue chasing. And by nightfall, again, we'll fill in all the details as we ride further along and see more of those scenes. Everything from here to the base of the big white domed monument over there, the Pennsylvania Memorial, that is all taken by the Confederate army in three hours of fighting on July 2nd of 1863.
It is. So yeah, you know that tree has bullets and shrapnel and all sorts of things still embedded inside it. Barn on the other side, you've got a giant hole that's in the brick wall. You look between the diamonds there, you can see where that was pierced by a Confederate artillery shell July 2nd of 1863. That's authentic battle damage. This is an image that's painted by an artist, obviously someone who wasn't here, about the last stand of the 9th Massachusetts, which is happening just right here around this witness tree. You can see the barn there, behind the hand there. See some various other buildings. See all their positions, their guns are now in 180 degrees. They put them in a half moon because they gotta fire that way, they gotta fire that way, they gotta fire that way, cover all of it. And Confederates are gunning them down at every stretch of the way. The 9th Massachusetts Battery, to my knowledge, is the only unit on this entire battlefield in their monument who doesn't just list their casualties, they list their horses' casualties. We mentioned it briefly earlier that you take out horses if you want to strand artillery. They brought 88 horses with them out into this battlefield on the morning of July 2nd. By nightfall, the handful of survivors who make it out of here, they only have eight horses still with them. The family who lives here at the time says when they came out, there were over 100 dead horses lying in the yard of this barn. You can only do the rebel yell, one, when you're running. And number two, he says, you can't do it when you have a belly full of food, which he would have by that point. He says, you're used to starving. And number three, he says, it's really hard to do when you don't have your original teeth. There's another one he's gonna say. The Union soldiers who heard it, overwhelmingly are gonna acknowledge in their writings, no one ever heard the rebel yell who wasn't scared when they heard it. While nobody can 100% authentically create it, I think the group that has done the absolute best in doing so is called the Liberty Rifles. And I don't think in our modern generation we'll ever hear anything that maybe more closely approximates the rebel yell than, than kind of this moment here. Just imagine that all around us. Six thousands of them and gunfire scattered in and what that does psychologically. Winfield Scott Hancock, he's the number two guy in the entire Union Army. He comes galloping down as fast as he can because he hears the rebel yell. He sees him advancing here, knows somebody's got to do something immediately or we're about to be annihilated. He rides up to the Minnesota and says, my God, is this all the men we have? What unit is this? Says, I'm Colonel William Colville, 1st Minnesota Infantry. Colonel Colville, do you see their flags? Yes, sir, I see their flags. Colonel Colville, advance your Minnesotans and bring me their flags when you are done with them. 262 guys from Minnesota with loaded muskets rise up, fix bayonets, and begin charging across the field in five times their own number. When they arrive at the edge, the way there was a depression, the Confederates couldn't see them coming, so there's an element of surprise here. They were at a run, they slam on a halt, and at this moment, accounts tell us they are four paces away from each other. That's like front to the back of the carriage here. They level their guns, fire 262 guns at once into the face of the Confederates. Now bayonets forward. They stab, they bite, they claw, they kick, they punch their way through the rest of them until they do the impossible. They drive back five times their own number. But the price of doing that on this field by nightfall, July 2nd of 1863, for all intents and purposes, the first Minnesota no longer exists. It suffered 83% casualties in about five minutes of heavy fighting here, done so the Union line will hold. General Hancock knows I need time to get reinforcements here, and I only have 262 guys to buy that time, so I need all of your lives in exchange for five minutes. And that is an element of why licensed battlefield guides exist. We were created by the veterans themselves in 1915 because they wanted it to be very clear that this was not just to be a place for recreation and vacation and fun. They wanted to make sure, number one, the story was told correctly, and number two, that it was told with the weight that they felt their experience required of it and having said that i do fully acknowledge it is depressing yeah, yeah. a lot of what we're talking about lincoln gives us these words that resonate for all time and a part of what he says he says in this phrase the world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. 
And we are doing right now exactly what President Lincoln asked us to do. Saying that 157 years later and beyond, we would never forget what they did here. This place still resonates here. And as we know, though the war goes on after this battle, it's not the first, it's not the last battle of the war. By the end of it all in 1865, for the first time in American history, the commander in chief has now joined his soldiers in the grave. When we lose our first president due to assassination, when Lincoln is gunned down the same week that Robert E. Lee will surrender in 1865. And if you look at every other revolution in the history of this planet, its leaders in the aftermath are almost always executed as a warning for it. When Robert E. Lee surrenders to Ulysses Grant, aside from the, I mean, we can say a lot of things about Robert E. Lee that are not flattering, but one thing I will say that is very flattering to him when he agrees to surrender, he has no guarantee that that is not his fate. He has, if we just get down to the cold definition, he has just engaged in a failed attempt to overthrow the United States government. He was the chief leader of it. He's probably going to be executed. He's not, though. Lincoln says, let him up easy. He believes in peace. So thank you all for being with us. I will hang around for questions as long as you want. Thank you. You can get around, check out those horses. Just go wide around before you approach them. Make sure you see their eyes before you approach them so you don't startle them. They've got blinders. I don't know if you guys did this, but I was trying to like picture myself there 157 years ago. Like seeing the soldiers in the field, seeing all those things and how they have preserved that battleground. Like the fences and the homes and the old buildings and everything is still authentic, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah so. for me, for like, just cause probably cause I'm not a boy, but what I, what I was imagining is all the moms back at home and all the sisters back at home and the girlfriends and the wives back at home not knowing what their what, what loved happened. ones were experiencing mm -hmm. and not being able to help. Very cool. We really enjoyed it. If you come to Gettysburg, get a tour from a licensed tour guide because so much information. So much information. It was really good. Fantastic. Kevin, shout out to Kevin. You were awesome. Kevin's thank the best. you so much. He was the best. So guys, thank you so much for watching today's vlog. I hope you enjoyed this. Maybe a little bit of a history lesson for you. I love history. Grady's loving history. So this was a this was a big day for us. Something I have always wanted to do ever since I was a little kid was come to these places like this and just, um, just see it firsthand. Because like Lane said on the way here, on the way back to the RV, she said it really brings history to life. Our country is in a state of division right now. And so it really being at that place where there was complete division north and south it really makes you reflect on how far we've come in the past 200 years I hope our country never gets to that place again but we've got a lot of healing to do we've got a lot of soul searching to do as human beings as people and as citizens of the United States we need to come together as one so we don't have another civil war because if we continue on the path that we're on I truly believe that it could get to that point let's just hope and pray that it never does so guys, thanks again. Hope you have a wonderful day. Next stop, Maine. Let's go.